Good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Chairman Monica Bayer and myself, Michael Kerr, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, session where we will talk about inflammation and uh, tendon. And uh, this is a, a topic that we'll try to address in a little bit different ways, but uh, hopefully at the end, there's, uh, if not a consensus, at least a, a confusion at a somewhat higher level. Um, we, of course, all of us are challenged with the clinical signs of inflammation, more or less in relation also to tendon, but there are also a lot of aspects of tendon pathology that we would like to touch upon, all the way from different types of cells, potential migration or change in the phenotype of cells, local vascular response in the tendinopathy, immune reactions, whether you measure it locally or in the blood, and finally also dimensions of the tendon, the swelling of the uh, tendon. And uh, it's a great pleasure, especially here on the 31st of uh, January, to welcome two people from the UK as uh, speakers, uh, namely uh, uh, Stephanie Deacon from Oxford and Neil Miller from Glasgow. And what we'll do after I'll give a little bit of introduction on the uh, physiology going into pathology with inflammation, uh, uh, Stephanie Dakin will go more into details that inflammation might not be as simple as we normally uh, consider it, and then uh, finally followed up by Neil Miller, who will then take it a step further and also addressing the issue of what potential pathways could there be for uh, future uh, treatment uh, approaches. Uh, if we look at the uh, tendon and inflammation uh, from the beginning, the, what I want to start by saying is that inflammation is like when you discuss what is early tendinopathy or late tendinopathy, you can always discuss what is inflammation. Is it a starting inflammation, a little bit of activation of the pathway? Is it a lot of activation or is it extreme? And everybody would agree when it's extreme, but uh, I want to notify here that even in a physiological situation, it seems like activation of uh, uh, inflammatory pathways are needed. And I'm going to show you two examples of it. The first example is the classical pathway producing prostaglandins. Uh, in the situation of normal exercise, if you have a tendon here, depicted here with the fascicles, and between the fascicles, believe it or not, there are vessels also in the normal situation. You might not be able to see it with Doppler, but there is flow in the tendon. It's not extremely high, but it does actually uh, go up with exercise, as you can see here, two or three fold, and then after exercise, it goes down again. If you now treat people so they block their uh, prostaglandin production by giving NSAIDs for a couple of days, then you can get to a situation where you totally block or almost block the prostaglandin level in the tissue, in the tendon tissue. You can also give a more specific blocker, only blocking the inducible change in cyclooxygenase, and then you will see that you won't change the basal level, but you will inhibit the exercise-induced increase in it. And the interesting part of that, that's just to show that you're able to uh, block it, is down here where you can see that the blood flow goes up with exercise, comes back again. But if you have either a specific COX-2 inhibition or a more general NSAID uh, uh, inhibition, then you will see that it doesn't influence the normal basic flow of the tendon, but it does influence the flow that goes with exercise. And a lot of you would think, do we need any increased exercise flow? Uh, but my belief at least is that there might be a physiological role if there is an increase in flow uh, for supplying uh, uh, not only oxygen, but also other things to the, uh, to the tendon. So if you, if you go around taking NSAIDs all the time, you at least don't get this rise in the blood flow during exercise. If we then look at the tendon and tendon uh, exchange of tissue or new formation of tissue in an adult tendon, we know from several experiments that most of the tendon, basically the, the big structures here, the fascicles, which have all these fibrils that we also now know goes from one end of the tendon to the other, that these, so to, so to speak, big trees here, they're not having any major turnover in the normal situation. So you're left with these stable trees and a lot of your turnover when you do exercise or lack exercise, then the changes in exchange of tissue is occurring either between these fascicles or maybe at the outer part 
Uh, the tendon here depicted also some EM pictures where you have the fascicles with the fibrils here, and all the colored areas are the interfascicular spaces. And there is reason to believe that uh, both in animals and in humans that a lot of uh, dynamic changes are going on every day in there, even without tendinopathy. Some of the data comes from a recently published study on animal data uh, uh, by Chloe Young, who's now postdoc with us. Uh, they showed uh, in that study here that there is a 24-7 exchange of tissue in this area between the fascicle. So basically what happens, to take a long story short, is that during daytime where you walk around or you might run or you do other things, there is basically a secretion of matrix. It might be small filaments, small fragments of connective tissue, which kind of is a waste product, you could call it, and pile up in these areas. And during nighttime when you rest, there is actually a kind of a cleaning phase. So similar to when we're done with this uh, meeting today, there will be some people who clean up during the night. And that seems to be going on uh, in a physiological sense. And there are some data indicating now that uh, tendinopathy, the start of tendinopathy, is probably when you push this too hard. So you have too much build up in these areas, and then you have an osmotic effect, uh, and the, the, the sort of cleaning process is not efficient enough, and that's uh, where the thickening of the tendon uh, begins. So Long story short, again, if we take this, what I just showed you there, and look at what is happening in these 5% active turnover uh, tissue in the tendon between the fascicle. And here is a study where you, again, have tried to block the prostaglandins uh, by giving people a treatment for three days before this study. And here they had a, a pretty intense exercise load. And then biopsies were taken later to see what is actually happening with new formation of collagen. And exercise normally stimulates a new formation in this small area of the tendon. But if you block the prostaglandins, you will not get any buildup of new collagen at all. So not only flow, but also the exchange of tissue will go down and you will not get the physiological effect by doing regular training of this exchange. So uh, in that respect, uh, inflammation in the physiological sense seems to be uh, important. Then you can uh, look at it another way and say what, what is really important for getting this dynamic process and the tendon going, and it looks like mechanical loading is the crucial thing. We know that with exercise you can increase it a bit, and here is an example of 14 days of immobilization on, there is a foot here, it's just a white sock, um, and uh, it's the 14 days immobilization, and what you could see here is that the normal exchange in the dynamic tissue between the fascicles goes exactly to zero. So the point is that if you unload a tissue, then nothing happens. It will go to zero. Probably nothing has changed. They won't get more pain, but you're not better off if you start again than three weeks later. And the interesting thing here is, at some point, we, we suggested that maybe if you block the inflammatory process, then you could avoid a little bit of it, and you cannot. So just lying in the couch and get, taking NSAIDs is not going to help the fact that everything goes to zero. And the last thing I want to mention before we dig into the uh, uh, tendinopathy and inflammation is uh, examples here from animal studies, uh, which is not tendinopathic. This is not healthy. This is a healing tendon in an animal model in rats where if you uh, cut an Achilles tendon and want to see how uh, it is uh, renewed, then you can see that loading does play a role for the uh, the effectiveness in terms of how much it can resist, which must be the ultimate uh, success criteria for a rupture. And you can see that if the animals are, are allowed to load more, there's a better effect. No news here. But the interesting thing here is at, at the, if you at the same time treat with NSAIDs, there are two mentioning from here. One is that just giving NSAIDs in a healing process of tendon is not going to help you at all because there's no effect by itself. And Although it's not totally taking away the effect of exercise, it will, if anything, it will diminish the effect, so you'll get less out of your training than you otherwise would. So uh, it's uh, potentially a good thing that there is some inflammation, and the real question we could discuss today in relation to, to inflammation is, of course, this whole ongoing debate of 
being tendinitis, everybody in the old days accepted there was some kind of inflammation. It switched over to tendinopathy, tendinosis. Maybe there was not so much inflammation. And now maybe the pendulum is switching something again. So we're somewhere in between here, and we just don't know enough of how uh, it is really working. So from a very pragmatic standpoint, you can take this picture as a, what I call a very classical study from, from Sweden, from 92, where they gave in chronic uh, tendinopathy, they gave NSAIDs to people who had Achilles tendinopathy. It's a randomized uh, control trial, and you can see that the outcome, at least measured here by the VAS score, is declining with time. That's good. But there is no significant difference in these two situations. So there's absolutely no effect of treating people with NSAIDs in this situation. So that would normally be a, good, a quick argument would be, well, there was probably no inflammation because it doesn't work, so there can't be any inflammation. And I think the two next speakers would try to shed light on that. Maybe the world is more complicated than that. Uh, if you look at people who had chronic tendinopathy in the Achilles tendon for some time, and you try to give half of them uh, ibuprofen, anti-inflammatory drug for a week uh, or not, and then take a, a, a biopsy and analyze for the content, uh, the mRNA, but also the content of COX-2, then you will see, although there's a big scatter, there's no significant difference on the two groups. We don't know if this level was artificially elevated because there's no control group. We just know if you take people who have a tendinopathy and you treat them with NSAIDs, you're not going to reduce this uh, inflammatory marker in this situation. And even worse so, in uh, a study where we tried to push it a little bit and said, okay, you don't have any inflammation at rest. Maybe you have it when you do exercise. We had people with long-term tendinopathy in the Achilles tendon to run uh, on a treadmill uh, for an hour to see if that could provoke anything. And if it had provoked anything, you would have an upregulation on the mRNA level, but there was no such thing. Uh, if anything, the only thing we could see that half of the patients got placebo and half got NSAIDs was that if NSAIDs did anything, it was actually lowering IL-10, which we normally consider is an anti-inflammatory uh, marker in this situation. But there was no sign, at least in the tissue, of a largely upregulation of interleukins that we normally associate with uh, inflammation. So is the question then that it's only when we look at it at the late stage and not at the early stage? And we probably will discuss a little bit later what is late and what is early, but attempts to look at it a little bit early that can be more or less well uh, de defined uh, is by the two speakers that will come after me where I just want to show one results from each of them just to set the stage. And this is a study that was done, published in 2010 by Neil Miller and his group in which they looked at people who had a supraspinatus rupture, and when they came in there, they saw that the subscapularis tendon was uh, affected also, tendinopathic, and that's what they here call early tendinopathy. And you can see that if you compare it with a, a healthy control tendon, then there is, and this is histological scores, but they did also other things, they could show that there were more positive stains for macrophages, indicating that there must be some kind of inflammation. We can discuss which type it is, but there was some kind of inflammation. And uh, Stephanie Dakin's group did uh, not a similar study, but at least uh, from the same, almost the same uh, tendons. They just looked also at different levels, let's say early, a little bit more late stage, also rupture. And they could also see a little bit the similar picture that it was mainly in those that they have defined as early tendinopathy, they saw a rise in inflammatory markers, at least here uh, depicted as the macrophages. What happens later, I think uh, Stephanie will talk about herself, but it's just to say that so far uh, at, at this stage, you can say, yes, there are some arguments that there is inflammation early in the process. There are also a lot of indications that the late stage inflammation is more difficult to grasp and we don't have any clear picture where we just can go in and treat with anti-inflammatory drug as the traditional ones. Uh, the attempt to look at what happens in early tendinopathy. We've tried that recently in a, a study where we had some people who had symptoms for less than a month. We had people who had symptoms for one to two months or two to three months. So basically they have never had any problems before, but they came in 
with their symptoms and we asked them, how long did you have it? And they would then fall into one of these three groups. There was a healthy group that then consisted of their training partners who never had any problems with a tendon. There was some Achilles tendon and there was some uh, patella tendons. And I'm not going to go uh, into a lot of the results because a lot of this is currently being analyzed. We would had hoped for a situation where there was almost nothing to find in the first situation and that it would gradually develop. But that unfortunately was not the case. A lot of the markers for, uh, for uh, tendinopathy were actually present pretty relatively early in this stage, but there was some uh, development. But I'll just focus on one single thing, and that's the angiogenesis. And you could see that here are the uh, people with Achilles tendinopathy and patella tendinopathy compared with healthy uh, controls, other persons, and here we then have the different groups here. And look at the development here. There is some development in the Doppler area with time, but the thing I think we should focus on is that there is a, a markedly increase already in those who come and said they had it for three weeks. So uh, if you're very critical to this, you could say, well, you missed the chance. You should have been there already after a week. Or what's probably even more the point, you should have been there before the pain was there. Because we don't know at this stage whether inflammation, though it's a part of the uh, 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 angiogenesis and hyperemia, whether it comes very early in the inflammation or it is a thing that follows a little bit later and then pain comes after that. But what we do know, and that was presented earlier today, is that if you take people in the very early stage and you supply them with anti-inflammatory drugs. There are, so, there are no clinical signs that they would be better off than the, the ones that don't get it. So uh, at, at least in this stage, there can be other aspects of inflammation, but in the traditional view, there's no really sign of what I've shown you so far that there is a massive uh, pathological inflammation, at least not one that has pathways that can be influenced by cyclooxygenase inhibitors. So I'm going to end with this one and saying that I think inflammation is important for normal tissue uh, and blood flow adaptation uh, in, in the tendon. Um, and uh, don't just uh, block your inflammation, uh, the physiological inflammation. There is a disturbed homeostasis of the tendon tissue. So when you overtrain, when you overdo it, it's probably that you build up a lot of uh, waste tissue in here. That requires then that there's a water coming in uh, and that will create the swelling that will occur relatively early. There will be an accumulation of this tissue, and then where the inflammatory component is in all that, that is still to be, uh, uh, to be thought. And then it's accompanied by an increase in angiogenesis that seems to appear relatively early, and then gradually, and I didn't show you the data of that, the only thing we know is that the new tissue formation that is increased, but that goes a little more slowly after the first three months. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael, for your talk. Um, are there any questions in the audience? I'll start with a clarifying one. Maybe there comes one. Um, during my question. Um, it's just when I think about it, the, um, we have the trees, the collagen, mm. fibrils, and, um, and then there is still a lot going on. Or not a lot, but there is something going on. So why do the cells build up this material which has then to be cleaned up by, um, by, the, uh, by the removal, mm. by the cleaning agents? Mm. Why, why, is, why is there a, a material build up that probably is not... Mm incorporated? What's your thought on that? Well, I, th I mean, I think in the in the, what we call the trees or the fascicle, I think there's a lot of dormant cells there that will be called upon when you have, let's say, a rupture. But then I think there are some maintenance cells, which are there are in all tissues, that sort of the make sure that there is some kind of dynamics. And you could, you, I mean, you can compare it with it's easier when the car is a little bit running to, to change the speed instead of starting from totally scratch. So you'd have to have some kind of homeostasis there. You can always discuss what, what is the reason, but I think, I think just the fact that these fascicles will also slide uh, to, uh, against each other will need that there is something in there, not only having sort of lupricine or something else, but there has to be something in there that makes sure that, that you have a, a readiness to, to cope with, uh, with uh, just normal changes. So 
do cells in the in the tendinopathy ten, tendinopathy um, suffering tendon are those cells not responsive to the enzymes? <laughs> yeah, that could be that could be so. But uh, I mean, the question is why why they would not be. But uh, you know, uh, there I mean, there are two there are two responses to that. One is of course that they don't respond to it. The other, which we will uh, get to hear more about, is that there are other aspects of inflammation which is not necessarily covered by anti-inflammatory drugs. But then maybe we should change it. Then the wording anti-inflammatory drug is is anti against some kind of inflammation drugs. Uh, so yeah. Are there questions from the audience? I see one and two. Uh, yeah. two. So we start right there. Hans Hoppler, Switzerland. Michael, thank you for your talk. And uh, obviously, when you have pain, you're already too late. Uh, something has happened before. Mm -hmm. uh, you say it's the cleaning that didn't work. Is there any way that could be detected? Because mm -hmm. it looks like one would have to do something yeah. before you actually get pain. Yeah. And I mean, this is really the, 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 the challenge. The interesting thing, by the way, on that study with the one, two, and three month was that the pain level when people came to the clinic, they were similar in the three groups. So some people have pain, a little bit of pain over three months, and then they come. Some have it, uh, let's say, over one month. And there could be difference between people when they perceive the pain. But to your question, what happened before that, I think what happens is if you have a mismatch in terms of this exchange and you build up a little more tissue, you take a little bit of water in, that might not be painful in itself. I mean, always if you had a rope there, but if you big, put a big stone in there or it has sort of a sufficient size, then uh, that would be sufficient then to get some pain. And if that's correct, then you could argue that then just the increase in size or any change in the tendon uh, with, with new modality, you could see changes, maybe new MRI techniques that can see changes inside might be the first warning sign that you should not push it tomorrow because then you will get extra pain. Well, I guess it's a little bit similar to uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. Yeah. I mean, the pain comes when the damage is done. Yes, yes, that could be. Yeah, that could be easy. And we want to measure it a little bit before. Yeah. <laughs> There's wonder. another question over there. Thank you, Michael. Uh, inspiring as always. Do you or do you know of any studies that have tried to look at the pre-differentiation phase of the macrophages? So before they start to differentiate, is there any way to, to work with that uh, in terms of, of looking at tissues? And or have you tried to, to do some local inhibition uh, and see if you change the pain, will the tissues change? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we haven't tried that uh, because that would obviously be one thing to, to, uh, to manipulate a little bit with the pain. Uh, the only thing we could see here was that the, the ones that got the pain the last, they were the one that has the most upregulation in substance P. So maybe we, we perceive pain differently, that there has to be a stronger signal and those who get it a little bit later, they finally get the point that now they have pain. Uh, regarding the first thing, we haven't done anything uh, in that aspect. I'm not aware, and maybe you come in detail with that, but that, that uh, anybody has really looked in, in, in detail regarding that. No. There's one more in the third row. Good morning. Thank you for a very nice presentation. I'm uh, Anna van der from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So I wondered if I understood correctly, you mentioned that NSAIDs may actually disrupt uh, tendon homeostasis or at least physiological response to exercise. Does that mean you would actively discourage the use of NSAIDs in people with symptoms of tendinopathy? No, that's. Uh, I hope I didn't say that. What I'm, what I was trying to discourage was that there is a price to pay if you do not have tendinopathy, but you know you go through, let's say, a very intensive training pass, and you would now try to avoid, similar to muscle pain, that I, you would now just pro prophylactic take NSAIDs because uh, better safe than sorry, and then you get less pain afterwards. Then what I'm saying is that you are actually influencing the physiological um, responses. We can discuss how beneficial they are, but, but there is reason to be t believe that your adaptation, your normal adaptation towards increased training or something else is not going to be as efficient if you block uh, 
the, the normal physiological change in, in inflammatory. So, so that's what I'm discouraging. So it's not that you can take that at no price, uh, even given all the other side effects. I don't think that, that it really comes out good. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Shall we? Great. Um, thank yeah. you very much, Michael. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, Stephanie Dakin. She's an associate professor at the University of Oxford, having done a lot of research in inflammation, chronic inflammation and fibrosis and uh, the resolution or the failed resolution of inflammation in the tendon. We are very happy that she's here today. And uh, the floor is yours, Stephanie. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Okay, then it's not perfect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to um, speak here today. It's a great pleasure to be at this meeting and uh, I've really enjoyed all the talks so far. Um, and thanks particularly to Michael and Monica for the invitation to speak in this session. Uh, my name is Steph Dakin. I'm based at the University of, of Oxford and I've been asked to speak to you today about inflammation and resolution in, in human tendon disease. And I do feel a little bit of a, a, a fraud because actually I'm a horse vet uh, by training and I spent uh, five to six years working in, uh, in equine veterinary practice with a particular interest in working with equine athletes. Uh, I spent a lot of time working with horses that had the misfortune to sustain tendon injuries, which of course can be not only career ending but life threatening in horses. Um, so that's where I found my, my clinical questions, and uh, that inspired me to study a PhD investigating inflammation in equine tendon disease. And then I really got the research bug, um, and I wanted to advance and translate some of that research from, from horse to human. Um, and I've spent the last kind of six years building up a, an independent research group at Oxford, and the focus of our research, just to give you a bit of context really, is um, we're really interested in understanding the mechanisms that underpin chronic inflammation and fibrosis in, in musculoskeletal soft tissue. So we have a program of work um, in tendinopathy, which we've been working quite hard on over the past five, six years, where we've looked at uh, tendon disease in positional tendons, such as the shoulder, but also um, in um, energy storing tendons such as the Achilles. And we also have an interest uh, in, in frozen shoulder, which is an inflammatory fibrotic disease localized to the, to the joint capsule. Um, for purposes of clarification, I'm going to use the term tendinopathy because I'm trying not to be too biased about the importance of inflammation, even though I very much believe it. Um, so, but I will kind of specify and clarify in my talk where we're talking about intact versus tendinopathy versus um, ruptures or tendon tears. So I just wanted to kind of uh, highlight that we know the etiology of, of tendon disease is complex and it's multifactorial. So we've got these kind of, um, we know that the effects of exercise, loading and aging, they're all kind of intricately linked. But there are also other factors that, that, that kind of contribute to this, this complex condition and genetic factors and um, conformational factors which can induce altered biomechanical loads of tendon. But of course inflammation is, is a factor and uh, I'm going to go straight in there uh, and focus on inflammation. The, the importance of inflammation as a contributor to the development of tendon disease has been somewhat um, contentious in, in, in recent years and one of uh, my MSc students, Mike Mosker, who, who was with us for a year, did um, a systematic review which was recently published and he wanted to kind of find out, you know, what's the trajectory of inflammation, tendon inflammation in the literature. And Mike found that really before 2008, the majority of published reviews didn't talk so much about immune cells, monocytes, macrophages, lymphocytes. They focused on a lack of neutrophils and because we don't see neutrophils, it means there's no inflammation. But what he found that particularly over the past decade is that there is growing support um, for an inflammatory component to tendon disease, both in the onset and progression of disease, and that this was particularly more prevalent in high quality reviews that utilized more robust definitions of inflammation. So this has kind of um, resulted in this uh, paradigm shift. So particularly in, in, in the past year, uh, the work of many groups across the globe, uh, Neil's group, uh, our group, Michael's group, 
has kind of added a bit more meat to the bones of learning more about inflammation in tendon disease. So the particular research questions that I'd like to um, talk to you about today and, and, and share some of our findings are, are firstly, you know, what is inflammation and, and can we characterize it in, in, in human tendon disease? Can we learn more about the particular cell types that are responsible for, for perhaps orchestrating, driving and sustaining tendon inflammation? Can we learn how tendons respond to inflammation? Do they mount any kind of counter-resolution response? And, and ultimately, the reason that we're all in this game is because we want to understand disease so that we can ultimately treat it better. So can uh, our understanding and, and new knowledge of inflammatory processes in tendons inform new strategies to therapeutically target ten tendon inflammation? So whilst I'm a vet, all the data that I'm going to share with you is, is from um, patients, from human patients. Um, so I don't have any animal data to present, and we are located uh, on the site of a hospital, um, which means that we're very uh, fortunate to be able to collect well-phenotyped tissue samples from patients uh, that have tendon disease. In contrast to this morning's talk, all of the data that I'm going to share with you today is from patients that have established tendon disease because they're presenting to a hospital, either for a surgical, uh, usually for a surgical intervention or treatment. So bear that in mind. What we're seeing here is that the data that I'm showing you from patients with a very established um, tendon disease that's been present for months to years. And what we've been able to do is uh, to collect uh, tendon biopsies or, or pieces of tissue from patients interoperatively during surgical procedures for tendon disease. And I'm going to have a focus really on uh, showing you data from the supraspinatus, the root, uh, rotator cuff tendon, and also Achilles tendinopathy and rupture. In some instances, we've been able to collect biopsies from patients before and after a treatment intervention, and that's been quite uh, quite useful to understand how things might change at the cellular level. And we do think it's important uh, to try and have access to healthy comparator um, tendons so that we can uh, we have a kind of benchmark with which to compare to disease. And um, m much like the work of Michael's group, um, we, we've, some of these biopsies can be collected interoperatively, but um, our kind of after-treatment interventions have, have been collected from patients under ultrasound guidance using uh, tendon biopsy and local anaesthetic, and these are generally very well tolerated by uh, amazing patients. So let's get into the data. Um, this isn't going to be an immunology talk, I promise, but I do have a few slides about um, some of our data on immune cells. And because I started out by seeing in injured equine tendons, we see a lot of CD14 or CD68 positive cells, which are of myeloid origin, so they could be monocytes or macrophages. This seemed like a good place to start in the human. So this data here is from patients uh, that had uh, supraspinatus tendon tears, and these were generally small to medium tendon tears. We saw there were a lot of macrophage uh, type cells in these tissues when we looked at them histologically and immunostained them, which is great, but we all know that macrophages exist as a kind of extremes of a functional continuum. And I guess historically they've been classified as M1, which means pro-inflammatory, or M2, which could be anti-inflammatory, but the reality is it's a slightly more complex scenario. So we tried to, to learn more about the type, the phenotype of the macrophages in these tissues, because that can, of course, affect how these cells behave in the tissue. What we found was that each of these markers represent different types of macrophage activation. So this is a NF-kappa B marker, this is an interferon marker, a STAT6 marker, and, and glucocorticoid receptor activation. And whilst this is a complex slide, all I want you to take from it is that there are macrophages in these small to medium rotator cuff tendon tears, and they show this kind of complex inflammation signature. We then did the same kind of approach to patients that had large to massive tendon tears, um, which may kind of represent clinically further down the line. What we found was that these, uh, the inflammation signature was slightly different. So we still had markers uh, that uh, we think kind of represent uh, tissue repair and fibrosis, but it was slightly less kind of angry activation, less NF-kappa B and less interferon target uh, uh, proteins expressed. <clears throat> 
We then looked at, at did the same kind of experiments in, in Achilles, because I think there's often this question of are positional tendons, is inflammation in positional tendons the same or different to functionally distinct tendons, such as uh, the energy storing Achilles. And essentially, we found the same kind of thing, this kind of complex activation, macrophage activation signature. But what we did identify was that um, we looked at patients that had Achilles tendinopathy and patients that had uh, Achilles ruptures, which may have presented a kind of acute rupture superimposed upon a chronic tendinopathy. And those rupture patients showed higher levels of COX-2 and, and higher levels of um, IL-8. And that may be a kind of reflection of the increased vascularity associated with acute traumatic rupture. This data here um, is, is where we were fortunate to be able to collect tissue biopsies from patients that had supraspinatus tendinopathy. So they had tendon pain um, and some slight ultrasonographic abnormalities, but they did not have a presence of a tendon tear. In these patients, we were able to collect biopsies from them before they had a treatment intervention and after they had a treatment intervention. And in those post-treatment patients, some of them, a year or so down the line, their, their tendinopathy resolved. And in others, their tendinopathy persisted. And I wanted to know, well, does inflammation change in those two post-treatment groups? And these are only small numbers because this is a very difficult study to do. But interestingly, we found that those patients that were pain-free down the line had higher levels of, uh, of, mark, of, of genes that are involved in um, resolving inflammation and tissue repair which was interesting, suggesting that there may be some kind of correlation between inflammation at the tissue level and patient symptomatology. So I've told you a little bit about um, what the macrophages are doing, but we've got to remember that in these tendon tissues, the majority cell type is, is a tendon cell. If you take uh, if you collect a piece of tendon from a patient that has tendon tear, if you digest this, and then if you look at what proportions of cells are present in that tissue, it's probably 10 to 15% immune cells, and the remaining is, is, is the tendon cells themselves. So I think it's important that we understand how the tendon cells are, are behaving in tendinopathy um, and tendon tears, because these are a, a, an area that we can therapeutically target. What we found, much of the data that I've showed you so far has kind of been looking at tissues in situ or ex vivo, intact tissues. But we also have systems uh, in our lab where we're able to isolate tendon cells from patient tissues, and we can use them in the lab and have various very simple models of inflammation um, to induce inflammation whereby you, you hit these cells with various pro-inflammatory mediators. But what we found in, in a fairly crude experiment, really, was that when you stimulate uh, tendon cells from patients that have had tendinopathy, they always respond more profoundly compared to tendon cells isolated from healthy volunteers. And it's various different markers. Equally, these disease cells always seem to hyper-respond in terms of upregulation of uh, target genes. So this kind of suggests that the tendon cells themselves might kind of take on an inflammatory phenotype when they're exposed to sustained inflammation. But what's really interesting is that you can, um, you can wake these cells up, you can freeze them down, you can do this repeatedly, but they still kind of retain um, that behavior, that inflammatory um, response. And when we go back to the tissues, um, we wanted to kind of see, well, do we see the same thing? There's been some really nice work done by um, the rheumatology field where they've looked at um, synovium from patients that have rheumatoid arthritis. And what they've noticed is that um, the synovium from these patients is highly proliferative, lots of fibroblasts there, and they show markers of activation, which suggests they have some kind of inflammatory phenotype. Well, we asked the same question of our, our, our patient tendon tissues. And this uh, data from the shoulder, we, these markers here all represent markers of fibroblast activation. What you can see is that these markers are much more highly expressed in disease. But what's really interesting is that when you take uh, the biopsies down the line from patients that have either got better or got worse, it doesn't really matter. These fibroblast activation signatures persist, which is really interesting. And we, we, Michael's got a lot of elegant work that shows, you know, we know there's not so much in the way of turnover 
that perhaps this could be an important mechanism for re-injury. And we see the same in the tissue as well. So I put this uh, picture of horses up, not just because I really like horses, because I, I still very much do, but it's to remind me to tell you that these, uh, the ten tendon cells themselves are, if you like, the workhorses of, of chronic inflammation, and they can be slowly fueling this fire. So I've showed you fibroblast activation is a feature of supraspinatus tendon disease. We also see the same in the Achilles. And in fact, this, this is a conserved disease mechanism across cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, tendon disease, um, frozen shoulder, and also cardiac disease. So now that we know a little bit more about how tendon cells themselves are behaving after chronic exposure to inflammation, how macrophages kind of um, undergo a change in their activation. I haven't spent much time talking about T cells, but perhaps Neil might mention some of that data. Um, what's critical is that we need to know more about how these cells are all talking to each other, and, and, and the vessels as well, because they can become uh, activated and leaky. And what is not clear at present is, you know, what are the lines of communication of these cells that lead to tendon inflammation resolving, and, 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 and what are the kind of crosstalk involved that means that inflammation persists? So during my PhD working with equine um, tendon inflammation, I became really interested in a process called resolution of inflammation. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. But I mentioned to you from the start that we wanted to know a little bit more about how tendons respond to inflammation. Do they mount any kind of counter-resolution response? So we started out fairly crudely, really, just looking bar for markers of, of, of resolution of inflammation, and do we see them in diseased tendons? And what we found was that uh, the, these uh, markers uh, here represent um, FPRALX and ChemR23, are, are, are two uh, genes and proteins that are implicated in, in resolution of inflammation. And we found that they were fairly highly expressed in, uh, in tendon disease. And not only were they expressed on, uh, they, they co-localized with markers of macrophages, but we also found them on non-macrophages and fibroblasts. So it suggests that there is some kind of resolution process. So what is resolution of inflammation? For those of you that uh, may not be aware of it, it's, it's the biological process that is triggered by inflammation. It's an endogenous process. It, it's kind of um, orchestrated by a repertoire of pro-resolving lipids and proteins. So much like you have an axis of pro-inflammatory lipids, there's a whole axis of, of, of pro-resolving lipids too. And the whole purpose of resolution is that it regulates the duration and magnitude of inflammation, and it's a protective response. The idea is that it brings your tissue back to homeostasis, back to normal. Um, and much like we have the, uh, the recognized five um, pillars of inflammation, um, Basil and Levy in 2015 described five pillars of resolution, and that this pertains to the removal, the restoration, regeneration, remission, uh, and relief. But this process is, is really not well investigated in, in musculoskeletal disease. And I've just put this slide up to kind of clarify that anti-inflammation is a distinctly different biological process to resolution. So resolution is whereby we have this family, these families of pro-resolving lipid mediators, some of which are called lipoxins, resolvins, and protectins. And these are the families of lipid mediators that act upon those receptors that I showed you in the tendon. So we wanted to ask the question, well, why, why does chronic tendon inflammation fail to resolve? What, what's the biological process going on here? We see inflammation, we see signs of resolution, but the, there's some kind of uh, mismatch in that um, chronic inflammation persists. So we uh, resorted to our in vitro models of tendon inflammation, where we isolate tendon cells from patients that have tendon disease and healthy volunteers. And uh, we stimulate these cells with um, an inflammatory cytokine, like interleukin-1-beta, to induce an inflammatory milieu. So we wanted to ask the question, in these incubations of patient cells, can we detect pro-resolving lipid mediators? Are they present? And then what happens? Um, is this a potential area for um, 
therapeutically targeting inflammation? Can we potentiate resolution? How do the cells from tendons behave when you incubate them in media mediators that potentiate resolution? What we found under kind of baseline conditions is that um, when you um, incubate tendon cells isolated from patients that have tendinopathy and healthy volunteers, they show these very different profiles when you measure the distinct pro-resolving lipid mediators in these incubations. These are, are, are simply just some candidate uh, pro-resolving mediators, maricins, resolvins, lipoxins, and this is, um, if you like, what aspirin gets metabolized to. And what we found in the disease tendon cells is that they show high levels of pro-resolving mediators, but also they show high levels of pro-inflammatory mediators. So this suggests that there's something kind of out of sync with this axis and that the disease cells compared to healthy cells are showing these kind of dysregulated resolution responses. So that kind of begs the question, well, are there other ways of, of trying to target tendon inflammation? And, you know, I, we think it's important that, uh, and Michael's already alluded to the, the important fact that inflammation, particularly in the early stage, does have some um, benefit. You know, we don't want to go in there with a blunderbuss and switch everything off because inflammation is part of a healing process. But clearly what's patho pathological is when it, inflammation becomes chronic. And what's important to realize is that um, if Michael hasn't given you enough reasons for talking, uh, avoiding um, COX uh, NSAIDs and their deleterious effects on collagen synthesis, COX-2 selective non-steroidals are toxic to these protective resolution processes. So they actually switch off resolution. So it may be that we might need to dampen or fine tune inflammation, but a potential therapeutic strategy um, is to potentiate resolution. And can we push, uh, by doing that, can we push chronically inflamed tendons down a pro-resolving pathway? So some final data to share with you is, is, is we tried this. So we isolated tendon cells from patients that had t shoulder, and, uh, shoulder and Achilles tendon disease, and we incubated them in stable analogs of pro-resolving mediators. And this one here, 15 epilipoxin A4, is essentially what aspirin gets metabolized to when you take aspirin. And what we found was that incubating um, cells in these com compounds under an inflammatory stimulus reduced levels of pro-inflammatory eicosanoids, and it also modified the kind of inflammatory phenotype of tendon cells. So these are both inflammatory markers um, at the transcriptomic level, and these are inflammatory markers, uh, phosphostat 1 and IL-6, at the protein level. But in, in addition to moderating inflammation, this same treatment seems to potentiate resolution. Uh, and we published some work on this recently in the FASEB journal in Achilles tendinopathy. So when you incubate cells from patients that have Achilles tendinopathy or rupture in various pro-resolving mediators, it kind of upregulates levels of enzymes that synthesize other pro-resolving mediators. And it also has a kind of feed-forward effect on upregulating the receptors that mediate resolution. So it seems to kind of boost resolution responses as well as modifying inflammation. A final point I'd like to make is that um, there are, have been some really exciting recent advances in the field, um, and that we're learning now that not all um, fibroblasts or, or tissue resident stromal cells are the same. One of my colleagues, um, Chris Buckley at Oxford, has done some really exciting work looking at rheumatoid synovium. And what they found is that there are distinct fibroblast subsets in rheumatoid synovium. Some drive tissue damage and some drive inflammation. Um, and we've also uh, just published something on, on bioarchive. It's some fairly early data, but we've identified that there are different types of tendon cell subsets in, um, in, in healthy and, and diseased tendons. And you might say, well, well, that's fairly academic. Why is that important? But going forward, if we're thinking that the tendon cells, which are the majority cell types in the tissue, they might um, be therapeutic targets. And if we can learn more about their particular phenotype and function, there's the possibility of selectively targeting 
uh, subsets of tendon cells that may, may be pathogenic or have a pathogenic phenotype and sustain inflammation. And there are various ways that we might approach that. And I really like this cartoon because um, I, I, I very much try to fly the, fly the stroma flag because I think we're learning much more about how these cells are behaving in disease. So my summary slide, um, the, the kind of take-home message that I'd like to convey is that I've, I've told you a little bit about chronic tendon inflammation, and that it is complex and uh, it's multifaceted. But what's interesting is that it's also plastic and dynamic, and you know I think it does change a little bit with disease stage, which is important um, for us to think about therapeutically. The tendon cells themselves are certainly not innocent bystanders in this disease, and we're learning more about their distinct phenotypes um, and their responses to inflammation, and perhaps they have some kind of capacity for memory of inflammation as well. I've showed you that there are common disease mechanisms in, in functionally distinct tendons, um, which is interesting because both positional and energy-storing tendons are showing common mechanisms. And I think it's important that we, we learn more about the particular subsets of, of um, tendon cells because that can inform future therapeutic strategies. And finally, I, I kind of want to emphasize, and it brings us back to it, our, our session this morning about you know, this early therapeutic window really is, our, I think, our best opportunity um, to, to, to target tendon disease and, and to give us the best chance of, of the patient having a successful treatment, particularly in light of these tissues that you know, turnover is very slow um, and the tendons that we have when we're 17, we keep with us till the, uh, our dying day. So there are many people to acknowledge. Um, there's a whole team um, uh, of people that I'd like to thank uh, within Endorms, uh, our colleagues, um, various sources of funding. And I'm very grateful to um, Professor Michael Kier and Dr. Monica Bayer for the kind invitation to speak today. And thank you for the organizers at the meeting. Just a final plug. Um, is that I run a, a, an MSc in musculoskeletal sciences, and we currently have um, applications are open if we provide academic training in the sciences underpinning musculoskeletal diseases. Please do uh, email me uh, or speak to me at the meeting if you have any um, further questions. And I'll happily take any questions about the talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Steph. Questions, comments? I can see Chris already raised his uh, hand there. Chris Mendias. Hi, Chris. Thanks. That was a very nice talk. And I was curious in terms of the, uh, the nature of the um, cells maintaining this inflamed phenotype in culture. And I'm wondering if you've looked mechanistically at, at you know, what the nature of that is. is it an epigenetic mechanism? Is it, are the cells really changing their phenotype a lot? Are they now sort of not really tenocytes? Are they still able to make tendon proteins like mm. collagen one? And I'm just curious if you looked at that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your, your point about epigenetics is important. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so we do work with these primary cells. It, they do senesce. So I think... Uh, all of the experiments that we work with, and we've kind of characterized them in terms of how they sustain the uh, proteomic profile that's characteristic of tendon. But generally, after passage three and four, you know, that tends to disappear and they do become senescent. So all of the experiments that uh, we perform, we try to use passage one to early passage cells. And, and epigenetically, we, we haven't um, shown this in, in tendon, but there are many other... Um, really elegant studies that where they've looked at other musculoskeletal tissues and shown how um, inflammation can change these cells at the epigenetic level. But it's really interesting because, you know, if you look at um, the work from um, um, Chris Buckley and, 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 um, and others in Germany, you know, fibroblasts know where they are in the body. So your fibroblast in your distal interphalangeal joint does have some kind of you know, epigenetic difference in memory to fibroblasts in your metacarpophalangeal joint. So that's an added level of complexity. But yeah, we'd need to go into epigenetics and, and ataxy, to, a, ataxy and that's, that's not my area really of, of expertise, but I'm sure it probably is biologically important. Steph, um, if, 
if we go back to some of the findings of this uh, inflammatory fibroblast type and the potential of changing it, I mean, if we link it up to the clinic, this really raises the question whether, you know, once you have it, even with your aspects of maybe future treatment, is that the reason why some people just get it again and again? Uh, uh, or uh, and, and the question is how early it comes, because a lot yeah. of the things you've shown here is not necessarily people who have trained a lot. Mm. I mean, a lot of the shoulder problems, it's very difficult to say who will get a problem and who will, who will not. It's not necessarily just judged by how much they're using it. So, yeah. so is it a combination of that some people already have, and once you have it, it's really troublesome, even before we have your resolution drug, to get away from it? it absolutely. It's really challenging. And I think, you know, this um, identification of mechanism of fibroblast activation is important. Um, I think, it, you know, we don't know for sure, but it, it, it's possible that once you've had inflammation, you've therefore kind of, the threshold for you having um, recurrent inflammation, it takes less of a, a stimulus, and that might be what might maybe why we get uh, recurrent disease, but that's speculative. I don't have you know, necessarily data to support that. I think what I, I hope I've shared with you is that we're starting to understand a lot more about the cellular basis of, of chronic disease, but I'm really curious to know, are we seeing, you know, in, in the... You know, for example, the types of tissues that you're working with in really early tendinopathy, are we seeing those markers there? And at what stage does this become critical to have a kind of permanent effect on the tissue? Yeah, it's just, I mean, just to follow up, it, it's just because the examples you showed with different diseases, I mean, on one side you have rheumatoid arthritis with recurring problems all the time. You have tendinopathy, which can come and go. You also have frozen shoulder, which people don't normally have a lot of times. So, you know, yep. there must be a range there. I probably, think so. Right? so Thank you for a wonderful talk. It was uh, slightly difficult to follow all the slides, so maybe my question is, is out of focus. But um, I understand that you see the same changes, uh, these long-lasting changes, also when people don't have pain anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, my question is then two. So, first of all, how do we know it relates to the pathology that actually is related to the pain? That would be the first one. And, and more interesting, perhaps, do you see it bilaterally or do you see it spreading? So is it a local phenomenon or does it really yeah. change? And then how does it relate to pain? Uh, so, so I'm going to answer your second question first because that, that's a really uh, interesting phenomenon. You know, sometimes... Um, so we haven't looked bilaterally, but of course tendon disease is frequently bilateral. Um, the reason we didn't do that was because our, our ethics couldn't cover it. But it is interesting and, you know, we know that often disease is present. It can be present in both joints. It's sometimes more profoundly symptomatic in one, so that's the one that you go for treatment. So good point, and, and I think potentially yes. Um, your second question um, is, is also a really interesting one because, you know, sometimes we, we do have this, and um, we talked about it in the previous session, we do have this mis mismatch between, you know, what you're seeing in the tissue and, and, and what you're seeing um, clinically. And the the interrelationships between inflammation and pain, you know, especially with this disease, are, are, are really complex, and they're not, they don't always go hand in hand. So it's challenging, but it, it, I guess all I'm, I, I was trying to kind of convey in my slide is that um, it certainly seems that once that this fibroblast activation in tendon disease seems to be, a, a, um, I won't necessarily say permanent, but a kind of long-standing feature of disease. If I then went back to biopsy those patients five to six years down the line, I don't know whether they would have kind of, the picture would have changed. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, but yeah. Okay, just to follow up, uh, do you know if there was any, of course you don't, but do you think there would be any changes before they had the pain and the, the tendinopathy in the first place? So it, could this be sort of, more like a disease rather than a overload phenomenon? I, and I think what's, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there, and I think this kind of um, subclinical phase is really critical because I think, you know, at that time, it's likely that there will be cellular changes and, you know, your alarm ins might start raging. You might get these low-grade changes in fibroblast phenotype. You might start to get in, in, infil, uh, cellular infiltrate, and it's, it's when does that kind of become critical to you becoming symptomatic and, 
I think that's a bit less clear. But certainly, I think, uh, yeah, if only we could get subclinical dis uh, tissue. I'll take a very quick one, um, Steph. Yep. Great talk. Um, you mentioned the fibroblasts that are out of sync. Um, we know that unloading is very detrimental for, for the fibroblasts in the tendon. Mm. So do you think if you have a specific loading regime on the tendon cells, um, would, that, would that sink the cells again? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And I think what would be nice to know more about is um, how, you know, this kind of link between inflammation and loading and kind of local and cellular uh, tissue stresses. I, for me, I think we, we need to do a better job of understanding that. But I think uh, that's an important aspect going forward. Thank you very much once again. So the last speaker of the session is uh, Neil Miller, who's been uh, in the area for several years. He's an orthopedic surgeon. I said before that you were from the UK, and we should maybe today stress that you're from Scotland. Yes. Originally yes. from Northern I'm, Ireland. I, I, but, I'm uh, Irish, I live in Scotland. But, <laughs> so I've still got my EU. But, uh, please, still, Neil, yeah. the floor is yours. So I've still got my EU citizenship being Irish, so I'm okay. Um, so yes, I suppose I always start by apologizing because I'm an orthopedic surgeon. This is a sunny day. This is beautiful Glasgow. This is the one sunny day a year. Uh, other times it just rains constantly. There's no uh, other way to put it. Um, so I, I'm a father of four daughters, so I don't normally get to speak very much uh, or have an opinion. Uh, but one thing, I've, one thing I've started to use in, in my lab and in my uh, uh, clinical uh, thing, uh, clinical aspects within the last year is this, this button, you must get one, okay? And you start, must start using it when you're questioning uh, tendinopathy treatments um, uh, and, and, and basic science. And I would give you a couple of examples, um, and just to be controversial, of course, you know, Loading always works in tendinopathy. If we, lived as, if, if we listen to certain geographical areas of tendon researchers, if you have a tendinopathy and you load it, you will always get better. <coughs> now, I am the first to purport that you know, loading must be the first line of treatments, but there are lots of patients that do not respond to it. And at a molecular level, we need to understand and stratify those patients and see why might they not be, uh, uh, why might not they be. So I use this button for this one. Now, I'm a surgeon, so you know, surgery must work in tendinopathy, it has to. I love to operate, but it has to work. A recent systematic review that we did basically shows it doesn't. Okay, so that's another one to consider. So, I, you know, my bias uh, it, when it comes to surgery is that I do not think we're at the stage where I can help very many people with surgery. Yes, there's a few, uh, again, substratified maybe. And finally then, about what this talk is about and what Steph and I have to put up with, a lot of people have to put up with in the inflammation and tender world, is this sort of uh, description that inflammation is not important uh, within the field. Um, and really, this is where I use this button mostly. Uh, when, I, when I'm told by various people that, you know, there's no inflammation. Inflammation is, you know, red, hot, swollen. We're talking about molecular inflammation that drives your patient to have pain, uh, matrix disruption, as Michael was talking. And I like to think about uh, tendinopathy as a sort of damage-mediated pathology. So what is that damage? It's exercise, it's hypoxia, it's very many different things. And your normal beautiful tendon is, is, is taken to this horrible... Um, uh, feature and you know all of my patients normally you know pain and swelling there but it's loss of function it's loss of ability what uh, you can and cannot do and treatments I think apart from this top one are pretty shocking and for a field really where we are and one of the largest musculoskeletal problems that we have our treatments have not moved on in, in about 20 years when we think of what's happened in rheumatology and cancer we need to better understand as Steph said the disease processes to help certain patients who won't respond to loading get better. That is our job after all. Inflammation in human disease really, you know, again 20 years ago nobody would have said that neurological diseases, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular and Alzheimer's had any inflammation or it was not a hugely important uh, part of the disease. CAR T uh, therapy in cancer can now cure lung, lung cancer. That's taking T cells out, modifying them and modifying the immune system has now led to huge advances. And we need to think about that in tendon disease also. So it's been a 10-year you know, uh, journey for uh, Steph and I where we've uh, been banging the inflammation drum and uh, 
Uh, I had to use this because orthopaedic surgeons can only really do pictures. It really is difficult for them when it gets to, to more than that. So we like to keep it simple. So we, we first reported this, you know, that stress with the tenocyte and some uh, inflammatory cells, there's, there, there's a balancing act to be had, as Steph said, between pro-inflammatory and, and pro-reparative. We, we all need inflammation to get better. As you sit here, you, re you require inflammation to repair your normal tissues. And I did an immunology degree, I suppose an immunologist at heart. So we, we like to think, or I like to think of the, the, the immunobiology of TEMS, breaking it into compartments. And as Steph has talked quite elegantly about, is this is the, is the tenocyte or the central general that sits and dictates to all the troops where to go. These are hugely important key regulators. There's the infiltrating uh, immune cell component, which is very important when you get initiation of damage. But, and what I'll talk a little bit now about is the immune sensing component, okay? There's a hugely important um, component within your tendon of immune cells that are, are sitting there ready, ready to go. And this is just to confuse you, because I like confusion, is that over the time, over the 10 years, myself and others, these are the mechanisms in your normal tendon as you sit there, or abnormal tendon, that have become dysregulated. And all of these have drugs which we can target, okay? So IL-13 failed in, in uh, lung disease, but is sitting there ready to go. IL-4, IL-6, all of these mediators have been trialed or are used in other diseases. And it, what I would say is, and to be controversial, is, is it not acceptable that we, that we can try these in our failing, uh, our tendon patients that aren't responding, uh, responding to load? And I suppose I work in a rheumatology department, around my boss is a rheumatologist, so you know, we all talk about this mid-portion or the core tendon tissue. Within a few centimetres is a really important immunological structure, the enthesis. Hugely different disease processes, but driven by mechanical stress. T cells sit here and produce very bad things. Patients get systemic uh, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis. And we can really take a lot from the uh, data uh, and patient reported data out there in thesis patients and try and use that. They're a completely different beast to treat, but they can have marked uh, overlap and we treat lots of uh, multiple tendinopathy patients that probably fall within that. So this is just to, so this is single cell data uh, from our own group. So this is, this is your healthy tendon. This is an under 25 year old with no history of uh, tendinopathy, okay? This is a hamstring tendon. And this is shoulder tendon in early tendinopathy, okay? This is our subscap early tendinopathy model. These are the normal tenocytes. These are diseased. Huge shift towards lots of different subpopulations. Lots of different cells which are doing different things. And see this down here? When somebody says to me there's no immune cells, there's no uh, in a normal tendon, there you go. And they increase, there is a shift in disease tendon. And when we pull, so here's the immune cells, tenocytes. And when we pull out T cells in it, or when we pull out a healthy tendon and a, and a tendinopathic tendon, here we go, we have T cells, macrophages, other immune cells I haven't highlighted. So in your normal tendon, these immune cells are sitting there primed to go to try and help your tendon get back to normal, to try and tell or communicate with the stromal cell, right, okay, he's been out running, he needs to, you know, he's at a bit of IL-6 in his Achilles tendon, let's tell these tenocytes to produce some uh, pro-resolving and get them better, okay? And this is just spatially, this is some uh, mass cytoff work is where we look at a tendon, human tendon biopsy and we color code these cells in. So these are T cells and macrophages here. All these are normal tenocytes. It's, it's to show you whereabouts in the tendon they, they, they sort of sit. So my opinion, and I'm happy to debate it um, uh, with you, is that I don't really think I should be using this. We need to move and we have moved and we should move. Uh, towards understanding the, the pathophysiology and using translational medicine to try and help those, you know, significant proportion of patients that won't always re re respond to loading. So it's taking our basic science and getting it into the clinical field to improve people's health. That's what I really am in the business of doing. And we, um, Paul will talk about this later in his prize session, but this is just to say this is what I truly feel was the first translational story, a little bit ignored but actually was the first true um, science, good science done in, in, in the field where running rodent models uh, showed that nitric oxide was dysregulated. 
looked in human disease, importantly, because we don't really care. If it's in a mouse, I don't really care. Unless it's in my patient, then this, this data is important. So mouse, human, and dissecting the mechanism, okay? And then using a patch therapy, and, we, uh, and Paul will debate with you later that it might or uh, doesn't always work, but it's an option. It's a translational option that was, de de that was born out of good scientific investigation that was taken into patients who, were, who had failed loading. And I think personally that is a very acceptable and logical way to do this. So in my lab, we always start with human disease, mostly in the shoulder and also using hamstring. If it's, as I said, if it's not there in the human disease and the patients that's sitting in front of me complaining, I don't really care. Then we backtrack into the mice after that. So we don't use, we, we, we invariably try to use less animals and less uh, animal research as we move forward. So interleukin-17 is a cytokine that is uh, probably known to uh, some of you um, as a very important in matrix regulation, wound healing, and is, a, a, and is a very prevalent in psoriatic or ankylosing spondylitis, so the seronegative spectrum of rheumatic disease, and it acts on mast cells and fibroblasts, acts very much so in the, on these tenocytes to cause MMP dysregulation, okay? And importantly, when this study was published in The Lancet, looking at secukinumab, which is an anti-IL-17 blocker, um, what they didn't publish in the original trial was when they looked at the enthesial <coughs> scores, so lots and lots of psoriatic ankylosing spondylitis patients complain of tendon problems, okay? Complain of enthesial problems. And when they looked at the scores after having this treatment, they had a 70% reduction in their enthesial scores alone. So that's Achilles, uh, lateral epicondylitis, shoulder, uh, et cetera. And so what we thought was, well, is it there, you know, is it within human tendon? So um, in, this is uh, some biopsies of early tendinopathy. So some mast cells store or may be able to produce IL-17 and they co-localize within the human tendon. So it, it's there in, uh, in tendon. When we take tendon cells out, as, as Steph elegantly explained, and culture them we, we, with IL-17, it causes a huge shift in collagen production and it's, it switches the phenotype towards a very collagen 3A, so bad type of reparative uh, collagen, and also switches on some nasty MMPs. We then, uh, with the help uh, of Novartis, were able to put this back, so we backtracked into a running uh, rodent model, and I'm happy to debate the pros and cons of a, a, run, uh, a running rodent model, but basically, surprisingly to me, if it's not something I ever expected, was that it actually changed the ultrastructure of the tendon down the road. So the supraspinatus and infraspinatus improved in structure, the animals were, uh, got back to function, their gait analysis improved significantly. So systemic delivery of an anti-cytokine therapy in a rodent model seemed to, uh, seemed to make these differences. And again, a cartoon for orthopedics, uh, basically that stress causes inflammation in IL-17, may be a hierarchical, what we call one of the more dominant cytokines, okay? There's lots and lots of cytokines, uh, but there's, there's some that may be more dominant. So this is where most people go, are you crazy? So we decided to um, take that into patients. I think there was enough evidence. Uh, we importantly, and I'd also like to say, is that its reproducibility of scientific data between labs is hugely important. So before I even thought about putting this into a patient, we, we sent... Uh, our biopsy samples off to other labs to confirm that IL-17 was present and basically to reproduce our results. And that doesn't happen in 80% of scientific research or academic scientific research. So phase two trial, placebo-controlled, double-blinded, uh, six-month study in patients with basically rotator cuff tendinopathy. MRI pre-treatment, uh, uh, pre MRI at uh, 12 weeks post-treatment and MRI at 16 weeks uh, post-treatment with shear wave elastography, uh, night pain, 16 million scoring regimes. We really wanted to top load it because we, you know, our scoring regimes and our, our patient report outcomes in tendon are not very good. So, um, so, phase, uh, so phase two, 100 patients worldwide with five EU sites uh, and four uh, US sites. Glasgow is the, the lead site. Just to explain to you, so this, we, we finished recruitment uh, tail end of uh, last year with just 85 patients. And the reason we only need 85 patients is only one patient dropped out. The drug is very well tolerated. And the IL-17 treat, treatment basically is one of the safest biologics that, that are out there at the moment. So that will, the, we've just data locked in that and we'll have the preliminary results at the end of March. And I'm very interested, I, I'm not wholly convinced it will work. But um, 
what I'm trying to say here is that this is the sort of way that we need to envisage newer, newer therapies, developing them, using the science, and going into larger trials. Do it the way that cardiovascular cancer do, does it. Okay? Uh, something else with collaboration with uh, uh, Stenopolis in, 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 in uh, New York is where we sent some of our samples over and uh, links in with Steph's data very nicely is that NF kappa B, which is an important um, uh, molecule for regulating matrix and inflammation, uh, was dysregulated in patient samples. Uh, use some fancy knockout mice to basically show that NF cap when knocking it out uh, uh, was a bad thing for inflammation. So maybe in targeting it with small molecule inhibitors may be uh, an important way to go. Uh, two treatments which will be which will this one will definitely be getting to your clinic over the next five years. So Samumed is a, a company in San Diego, and Wint, in, Wint inhibition basically will will cure impotence, baldness, osteoarthritis, whatever you choose. Wint inhibition is hugely important. They have a huge program going on. They're just about to finish their phase three trials of the Wint inhibitor in osteoarthritis of the knee. And they're about just starting a phase two trial in Achilles tendinopathy with this very nice um, uh, early animal data. And it's a gel, interestingly for Paul, it's a gel-based delivery system to the Achilles. Knocking out went inhibition uh, to see whether that helps patients. And a trial we're starting in Manchester in March so it'll be, uh, is delivery of a microRNA uh, treatment for um, elbow tendinopathy. Okay, and that's again looking at imaging and patient reported outcomes. Okay. So those sort of there are a lot. There's a lot going on in the field. Uh, one very uh, close to, uh, to market. Uh, something else I'm very passionate about, and to finish off with, because I'm sure you've had enough, is I, you know precision medicine is we can do it in, in, in tendinopathy. So uh, we have a nice. We run a specialist. Everybody says to you run a specialist clinic. Walk away very quickly. Uh, it's it's a, uh, it is a pain, but it's good fun. So we do pan Scotland. We've got 5.3 million uh, people in Scotland. We sometimes allow English people in, uh, <laughs> but not. We don't. We like that too. We, we much prefer Europeans to come. Uh, so, um, and that's myself. And look at this beautiful, handsome man. Well, he has to be a rheumatologist because they don't do very much. So you know, he's got time to preen himself and his beard. And we 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 sit together. We give each patient 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we go through all their past uh, physical therapy. We go past everything. They're psychosocial. If you ever hear an orthopedic surgeon talking about psychosocial, you're always in problems. So we, we really do give them time, um, discuss individual precision treatments for them. And on nearly 95% of the time, that is changing their loading regime or getting them back to a loading regime. Very few times we may add in a biologic if, they, if we feel they're more like an enthesiopathy type patients, which you, as, as Paul's, uh, uh, Paul Kerman has shown before, you know, remember those seronegative type enthesiopathy patients when you're, when you're diagnosing uh, uh, what you think is a unilateral tendinopathy. Um, and I think this is the way, this works very well for patients. Um, yes, it's time consuming, but on the whole, they, they, they do get better. Um, use the button. Okay, use the button. When you're reading manuscripts, when you're reading you know, work by me, work by others, think about it. Is it, is it real? What, what's, is it going to help move? Understanding the pathogenesis is key. Without that, we won't move treatments on. We won't understand how exercise influences a tendon at a molecular level. Well, how, it, you know, how does it help the collagen fibers? If we don't do that, there's no point in getting out of bed in, in the morning for me. The molecular ear is here. I'm happy to debate that with Many people, it is here, it's here to stay, but I hope it's here so that we can actually deliver um, these translational therapies for not everybody, not everybody who's going to walk into the clinic is going to get an IL-17 or a TNF blocker, but there is a subpopulation of tendinopathy patients that probably need that targeted uh, level of, of, of targeted inflammation rather than, as Steph said, the blunderbuss COX-2 you know, uh, 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 treatments. Um, so I've uh, yeah. So my funders, my uh, lab group, which is fantastic. So as I say, my boss is a rheumatologist, uh, and George out in Sydney. I couldn't do it without all these people. This is what uh, my scrub team on a Monday when I operate. This is what they do after five minutes of listening to me. I hope <laughs> that you do not feel the same way. I'm sorry if you do, and I'm, I'm delighted to take any uh, questions or debate with you. Uh,